hand over to Hannah now from Garden Organics. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, so I just thought I'd start with a little bit about who we are. So we are the UK's leading experts in organic gardening. We're a membership association and charity, and we were founded 65 years ago as the Henry Doubleday Research Association by an organic growing pioneer, a chap called Lawrence Hills. So set up down in Essex, but we're now based just outside Coventry um, at an organic demonstration garden called Wright and Gardens. So our main purpose as a charity is simply to get as many people as possible growing organically to support biodiversity in the natural world. There are three main ways that we do this. So firstly, we carry out research. So we do academic um, research with academic institutions and other organisations. And then we run citizen science projects where we send members up and down the country and, and experiments take part in. They all take part in it. They send back the information and we use that to inform our own guidance and to get a sense of any changes that growers are experiencing with climate change and um, different pests and diseases and how people are really adapting to that in their own gardens. So the second thing we do is our heritage seed library. This is a really long running seed conservation project where we grow, store and collect over 800 vegetable varieties. So these varieties were once the mainstay of, of gardening, but what happened in the 1970s is new seed legislation came in, which meant that varieties needed to be licensed for commercial sale. And as things stopped being licensed, it meant they were no longer available for people to grow. So what we do is we take varieties that you can't buy anymore, we grow them, we store them and we share them with our members. And that's a hugely valuable um, resource of genetic material for gardeners. And then the last thing we do is we raise awareness of the importance of organic growing and sustainable gardening and share practical tips that people can put into place at home. So this ranges from our campaigning against the use of peat in horticulture through to things like this talk and our podcast, the Organic Gardening Podcast and the information we share on our website and on social media. It also includes work in communities. So we have around 500 volunteers across the UK who support their local communities with practical advice and help. So that might be going into a school and helping them set up a composting system, taking the food waste from their school, or going to a farmer's market and giving out advice to people that come along there. We're a membership association and a, a charity, and we're predominantly funded by around 20,000 members who are all based across the UK. So members join us to support our work and be part of a movement of like minded growers, but they also have access to our expert advice um, and information just to help them at their in their garden and allotment. So if you are interested um, in getting involved in the charity or finding out a bit more about organic growing, seeing for some looking for some specific advice, I'll pop a link in the chat for more information and we'll send some out after the after the talk. So with me today is Chris Collins. Chris is a font of knowledge when it comes to organic gardening. He used to be the Blue Peter Gardener, the head gardener at Westminster Abbey. So um, if Chris doesn't know it, it's not worth knowing. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, Hannah. So everyone thank you hannah for that introduction um big thank you for everyone giving up the reading this evening we're uh, um, really it's really great to see you so hope you get a lot of information about wildlife gardening over the next 45 minutes or hour or so um i'm going to start off with these two pictures because uh, these are the two, two areas i garden and really and this is philosophy of garden organic as well is we see a garden as a partnership really as a shared space so we tend to garden we're a very quite sort of fluid lots of stuff mixed together, not too uniform. So our, our veg will be with, surrounded by our flowers, with our herbs and our fruit, all mixed together, but it's all wildlife friend, uh, friendly. We want as many guests as we can possibly get. Um, so that's really our philosophy, and hopefully you'll find out a lot more about it as we go through these slides. Next slide, please. Well, I put these up because I just think these are some of the things I'm lucky enough to see in my spaces. And um, a bat, I get bats off my balcony, and I can't tell you how excited I get. I'm like child on christmas day when a bat turns up i really am they only come a couple of months of the year but they fill me with joy um i'm big fans of hoverflies they're great at eating aphids and they're good pollinators i think they're very beautiful as well we'll talk a little bit about them 
Slow worms. I get slow worms on the on the allotment. They eat all the kill worms, uh, slugs, sorry, which uh, do a lot of damage. So they're really useful. Uh, you get them camp, uh, k- kipping in the compost bins. Obviously, earthworms we all know about. Can't be a garden without lots of little birds. I eat my caterpillars, just the sound of them in the morning. Ladybirds do a job for me as well. They'll eat the aphids. We'll talk a little bit about them. I haven't found a stick caterpillar yet. That's uh, You can see that there um, on the bottom left. Um, but I'm keeping a lookout. And that's just the whole idea. We talk about... Um, um, when we talk about wildlife, we tend to think of safaris and big animals and lions, but our country is full of wildlife. We just need to look a little bit closer. So I'm going to start off with a compost bin and you think might wonder why. What's that got to do with wildlife? Well, first of all, soils. Soil is a universe in its own right. There are billions of creatures living in our soil and they all do a job from funguses to microorganisms to worms. They're such an important, nothing will work without good soil and they're the centrepiece of garden organic really that's the thing we really try and get across the most but also I'll let you into a little secret is a compost bin can contain up to 2,000 species of wildlife from fungus to birds to, to nematodes to microbacteria it really is a massive safari of wildlife if you like and this also means you can rot that down gently use it as a mulch keeping your soil nice and healthy I'm going to go on for my compost um, um, slide there just to do the best way to get a what I call a very frugal pollinator border, okay? It's something very simple. You can do this in containers. You can do this in a narrow strap of land. land. And I'm a bigger grower of hardy annuals, okay? I really love a hardy annual. And really for about 20 pounds, you can get a really substantial border of colorful plants that will attract both bees and butterflies and hoverflies. Hardy annuals, obviously, as the name says, they'll only grow through the summer, the spring and the summer, and then they overwinter as seed. But you get a brilliant combination. Some of the things that will attract bees, sunflowers, sweet peas, snapdragons, uh, annual daisies, calendula, um, the English marigold, cornflowers, nasturtiums. They all come about two pounds in, in a packet. And then you can see through the course of the season, you sow them in open ground. I'll go into that in a second. And then you can see through the course of the season, they grow and they start flowering about June, sort of mid-June, and they'll keep going right through to the first frosts. So very for quite a small amount of money, you can get a really load of colour. And what I tend to do, um, on my veg plot is I grow them along the sides of my veg so almost like a wildlife or pollinator corridors that are matched in so hardy annuals really important I think um, they also set seed I'll talk a little bit more about this later they're very good at setting seed and you can collect seeds off them um, so very very cheap and easy way to get pollinators and I'll show you a little bit the next slide I'll show you a little bit how I would go around sowing them And so this is my friend here. You can see this is really easy to do. You can do this in a board. You can do this in a pot if you really wanted to, a big container. But what I'll tend to do is I'll then section out each bit like this so I can um, um, grow the different types of plant that I want in. So I might have sweet pea in the corner, some flowers in the centre for height. But then all you do is you drill sow them. I do this probably around March, so you start preparing now. If you go to buy hardy annual seeds, you'll know what they are. Not just name-wise, but uh, every co- a good seed company will have the letters HA written on the packet, so you can see it's a hardy annual, as opposed to a half hardy annual, which needs starting under glass. So you can do these in drills. I tend to put drills in quite maybe 10 centimetres apart. I sew them quite thick. And what you do is if they're in a drill, it's a nice straight line. Obviously, you put a, a small little um, trench in, you sew in quite thickly, cover over. Um, I don't tend to dig the soil too much, especially in an open garden, because what happens is you can end up digging up all the uh, all this weed seed that's, uh, that's sitting underneath the soil. So a little light fork and a rake, take out any debris that there, any weeds that need removing. Put in drills, which is like lines, and then label. I tend to mark the drills with sand as well. And what you'll find is they'll come up in straight lines, quite thick. You'll know then what is a hardy annual seed and what is not a weed. So if there's if you have them scattered and you're not sure what's weed and what is a hardy annual, and then gradually I'll thin them out so they've got the room to grow. That early stage when they're quite thick in the in the in the when they germinate encourages them to get up and be more quick. So that's all you're doing. And when, once they're up, the first vital thing is when they start to germinate. It's thin them out and then make sure they get plenty of water while they're young. Make sure they don't dry out. Once they, you've got that, when you, once you get into May, they're pretty self-sufficient plants. You can, they'll get up, they'll start flowering. You don't really have to do much. I tend to deadhead mine to encourage further flowering. If it has to be bone dry for me to water, I don't irrigate them much. So actually, or maybe things like sunflowers, I might need to stake to make sure they don't flop over. But you're getting a really good pollinator border for very little amount of money and quite easy to do. Next slide, please. 
If that um, um, all seems a bit like you haven't got time for it, obviously you can go for a wildflower uh, border. This is an annual one. This is one that a lot of people do. So this again is hardy annuals, but this is uh, they're sown in a big dense uh, what you call broadcast. But you can actually sort of hand pick wildflowers for different areas. You get verges. We did one recently last year, which was um, on chalk, where you remove the chalk so that's the top soil. And what they tend to do is they like very impoverished soil because they're colonizers. And then you can sow certain plants in, into that. So things like this I quite like because it's an instant pollinator border. You can buy these already made up in packets and then you can sow them in. Or you can collect the seeds yourself, which is what we would encourage you to do at Garden Organic. Once you've got your hardy annuals up and running, you can start to um, um, collect the seed and store the seed and do it yourself. But this would probably only last one season and then you collect the seed and then you go on again. The only rule with hardy annuals, with their wildflowers, sorry, no matter what type it is, is you probably cut it down in the autumn, let it go through the spring and the summer, let it flower, cut it down in the autumn, then you remove all of the of the clippings, and that way you're not feeding the ground and then more aggressive species come in and take over. But you can sow this annually, one like this with poppies um, and annual daisies, this kind of plants, um, cornflowers, very easy to do, and then you can just sow it again the following uh, spring. Next slide. So when I say broadcast, so that's what I'll do again, like I did with the hardy annuals. I'll rake it very lightly. I won't dig too much. I don't want to turf up seed that's already sitting in the soil. Rake it very lightly, get a nice tilth on it, remove any weeds. And then I'll get a big handful of seed, uh, mixed seed. And I'll probably mix that with uh, some, some um, silver sand or some horticultural sand. And I literally use my arm, just work backwards, spreading it all over the area. Again, very, very important. Once it starts to germinate, make sure you give it some irrigation till it's up and it's and it's self dependent. Very, again, simple to do. If you wanted to do that in a big pot, don't even need an open garden. That works quite well. Next slide, please. The other thing I think also is people don't associate. I see I get a lot of criticism is um, people think maybe lawns are no good for what for, for pollinators, but actually. Lawns actually are really rich. You can have a short grass lawn and still have plenty of decent plants that will attract hoverflies and bees and butterflies. Clover is a perfect example of that. Absolutely, bees go mad for clover when it's flowering. Um, and you can get seed mixes that can go over the top of your of your existing turf. Um, so I think what I do is you can actually get these seed mixes or you can introduce things. But I, what I do is I'd get a lawn rake, like a, uh, um, um, a spring box, if you know what it is, a lawn rake. And I would gently go over my lawn, very gently. I don't do it too much, just to turf it up a bit and scratch the surface. Then I'd get my short seed mix and I'd mix it with a groundsman's mix, like a greenkeeper's mix. You can get this um, sort of sandy loam, basically. And you mix it all together. And then you, what you do is you throw it across your lawn and then get a rake. And the back of the rake, you just work your way in and make sure all that seed sort of contacts the soil, OK? And then you'll get stuff coming through. You want anything like daisy, buttercup, um, even yarrows, brilliant for bees. You can get all these going. Obviously, one rule is, is don't scalp your lawn. But if you, it's not a good idea to cut too short anyway, because it just goes yellow every, as soon as the sun gets too hot. So I think definitely don't um, be put off having a lawn. I think they get a bad rep. You can get lots of, I've, I was told that apparently you can get up to 22 species of plant in a short lawn. OK, I think a good rule is what I'd call the rugby cut. Never cut it below 2.5 centimetres so you can get the plants to reflower, OK, you're not scalping them and doing them too much damage. Alternatively, as well, you can have a long grass area in the corner. You can plant your daffodils in there, your crocus, let it grow longer. And then you've got that's a brilliant area for bees and butterflies and general wildlife. So short area with mixed planting in it, let, let other plants establish and a long grass area for bulbs, etc. is a really good way for wildlife. Next slide, please. And obviously, I mentioned earlier, um, Seed collecting so good. I'm do, I would do that at the end of the um, autumn. I always really en enjoy doing it. Um, you know when the seed's right normally with most seeds, because if you just tap the flower head, it will come out into your hand. I tend to maybe, if they're not completely dry, I'll get a line in my shed and I'll turn them upside down. I know Emma does this at Wrighton as well to dry them off and the HSL with a veg seed just to dry them off. And then I'll packet them in paper envelopes and store them in, in a Tupperware. Um, um, and also, other thing you might want to do, if you want to introduce plants into long grass area and you're not getting much luck with seed, is just introduce with plug, plug plants. Um, there are a lot of good uh, organic wholesalers out there who might be able to help you with plug plants. They're so cheap and you literally just get your trowel and 
place them in and hopefully you'll get them encouraging for any long grass area or maybe short as well. They're just two good frugal methods to make sure you're continuing uh, adding plants to your collection. Um, certainly the seed saving is a brilliant one. Um, and you could just then keep overwintering, 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 and then re in the spring. Next slide, please. I'll say a little bit about wild, uh, wildlife plants. Obviously, wildflower plants. I, um, I'm a big fan of the dandelion. I think it's quite a popular plant these days. When I started as a gardener in a, um, it would be quite, quite a few decades ago now, obviously, we saw a dandelion. We were instantly told to take it out. Um, but it has actually, I think, I like to think of it as a bee cafe, basically, because it's one of the earliest plants to start flowering. And the bees kind of really need it before anything else has sort of come into flower. Um, so I, I think a good idea of this is to, what to do is to have what I call a wildlife, like a wildflower corridor. So if you have a strip of land, uh, a border, and you have a strip down the back and you just let those plants establish. If you're worried about seeding, you can always deadhead. I deadhead my dandelions. I've got a few beauties on the allotment that I deadhead. But I think they're very important. You are removing a good source of pollen if you're digging them out as soon as you see them. So I think there's a little bit of uh, time. Obviously, all organic gardening and wildlife gardening, you need to be a bit relaxed. It's a bit looser than the more regimental type of gardening. But I would allow definitely um, for dandelions to be there. Maybe a wildlife corridor is what uh, a, a wild plant corridor. You can just have that as a strip running down the length of your garden. Um, I've been told um, that if you just have a little pl a plot of it, a single bit of it, they tend to just stay in that area. So having something that runs your garden, uh, runs down the length of your allotment or your garden, then that means that all those pollinators are, are, are actually attracted to it. Next slide, please. The other thing also is just to think about the seasons, think about your plant choices. Um, obviously, you can't really go wrong with a with a, an herbaceous border. It's uh, it, a lot of those plants will be very attracted by bees and butterflies, etc. You also maybe want to look at some natives on the bottom left hand corner is a plant called Viburnum opulus. It's a native Viburnum, has these amazing red fruits in the autumn. Birds absolutely go crazy for it. Absolutely love it. Um, Lamium maculata, the dead nettle, nettle you see on my right. That's a very early spring flowering plant or go to early summer as well. That's really good for bees. They absolutely love that. And also the other thing I haven't mentioned is you could have green manures over the winter. Um, so you might want to you have an empty bit of land. You can sow it with a green manure um, like Secium here. And then you, you, they'll come up early spring uh, um, before you dig them in. They'll flower. That will bring in early source for bee as well. So it's a good idea just to think through. And there's one plant I will mention because everyone will forget about winter, but there's a plant called Arbutus anedo, the strawberry tree. You might well know it. It's an evergreen plant, very, very beautiful plant. As it's ha really delicate hanging yet white bell flowers, followed by a red fruit, which is where it gets its name from. Takes most soils, nice waxy leaves, so it takes exposed sites as well. But for winter, like buff bees, buff tail win uh, bees in the winter, I absolutely love that. So you've got a little bit, I know I don't want to give you tons and tons of plants now. You can come back to me if you want to list or more of them later after we've finished. Um, but just to think about the seasons when you're thinking about planting and what the plant's doing and when. Next slide, please. I'm going to have a little shout out for one of my favourite plants. I think it'd probably be one of Hannah's as well and certainly one of uh, Garden Organics. Uh, Lawrence Hills, who set us up, it was mentioned earlier, came up, he, he looked for organic um, sources of, of fertilizer and comfrey bocking 14 is is uh, an amazing plant that's great for bees for a start they absolutely love it but as well as being quite a beautiful plant it's a brilliant compost accelerator it's brilliant uh, as a liquid feed um, and it's brilliant as a comp as a soil um, um, like to keep the soil healthy as well so it does a multitude of jobs it has very very long roots so it taps into the subsoil and brings up minerals that most plants can't get to the great thing about bocking 14 it'll grow in a pot and it'll also, it doesn't spread in open ground. Comfrey, normal comfrey can get a bit carried away if you're not careful. So it tends to stay contained. Um, so, and it just looks great in the basis border of pot or whatever, but it does all the, it's a gardener's plant, I would say. It really is not an organic fertilizer, an organic compost accelerator. Next slide, please. Well, no garden would be complete without bird life. I'm sure everybody who's here tonight would agree with that. I absolutely love the bird life. No, a garden without bird song is a, it's just not a garden, is it really? I think with a few tips and tricks, you can certainly uh, bring them in. I've got on my balcony, um, I've got bird feeders stuck to the windows um, that I put in. And they, uh, I'm, I'm just, I, I counted 10 different types of bird this morning. Long-tailed tits, um, goldfinches, blue tits, great tits. I had a woodpecker 
So they really do come. Um, and once you, uh, there's two things you need. You need the wet and you need water as well. Make sure you put water out. It's, um, there's no finer sight than a robin having a bath. I know that sounds a bit strange, but it is really good fun to watch. So you want to be able to encourage birds into, into, your, into your garden. Um, next slide, please. So one of the one, obviously one of the ways to do it is to feed them. Uh, I don't actually feed my bird life during the spring and the summer. I think there's enough natural food around for them to get on with it, really. I think that what can happen if you're feeding them all the time is the more um, savvy birds, like the great tit, the blue tit, will just take over a little bit. You'll get lots of them and other birds get knocked out. That's not scientific, um, but I think that's what tends to happen by observation. So, but in the winter, the autumn, the winter, I'm quite happy to feed them. And at the moment, it's great to see them. So fat balls, homemade fat balls. I don't try to buy any bird food. I try to make it myself in all respects. So the suet or lard mixed with sunflower seeds, uh, maybe a bit of peanut butter even. Uh, chunks of apple, I, put, I hang out as well. That's They seem to really, really like that. Um, and also, like I said, water as well. So you can make your own bird food. It's quite good fun to do as well. If you've got kids and stuff, then that, that's always a good one. Next slide, please. And then I think you've got to grow these because I grow loads of sunflowers on the, the allotment. Um, I grow them outside the property as well. They grow them at Wrighton. And they are just brilliant for bird food because you, you, you can just grow a big warm, warm. They look amazing for a start. They're, they're quite an astounding plant. I know everyone mentions them. But I then take the old heads and I dry them out. And I'm still feeding from last summer my birds with sunflower seeds. They're just really so good for it. Now, that's free. And I'm telling you this. What's amazing is I've, I've used bought food, uh, bird food before. But the way they demolish natural <laughs> sunflower seeds, it's not there and it's gone in two hours. They really, really seem to love it. So, again, back to hardy annuals. That's what a sunflower is. You can put a nice big row of those in. Um, I tend to put them outside uh, my polytunnel in big rows. They look really impressive. They got really huge last year. And then I dry the heads out. And that's my bird food for the winter as well. Next slide, please. Of course, uh, I'll talk say a little bit about birdhouses. Um, there's a few sort of uh, things I would do. I'd love to have a birdhouse that size, but I haven't got um, the room for it. Uh, but it, it is quite impressive. Um, obviously, if you've got one, you're going to put one out. Always it gives it a clean in the spring. You don't want to over harbour any wind, any uh, diseases that might be in it as well. The, the general rule I would say is make sure it's two metres off the ground. And that way it's protected from cats. Cats won't get up that high or, or, or it's, uh, um, cause them too much problems. It's good to sight it near cover. So, I mean, in my luckily here on my balcony, I've got lots of ivy on the trees and that's brilliant cover for birds. So any kind of climber, wall climber or shrub where they can sort of hide in it and come and go as they please is quite good. Um, so shady as well, not too much direct sun, a little bit of sun, maybe southwest, southeast uh, area might be good. I know that makes, you can still do it north facing, but um, they quite like a little bit of shady and some, some sort of light shade, really. Um, and also keep it natural materials. I know you kind of see all these bright red and bright orange bird boxes and these highly decorated bird boxes. I think that's probably a bit of a no-no. I think keep the materials as simple as possible if you can. And the holes for them, maybe three, these are too big, I would say about 3.2 centimetres and that way the smaller birds can get in and out without much problem. Um, yeah, make sure you've got plants around. They can hide in and come and go as they want. And then you hopefully your bird boxes will, will get full. Some people don't like using them. Some people think birds can, um, can nest naturally. And that's probably a point, to be fair. But you might want to have a bird box. I don't think it does any harm. Next slide, please. And then they've come to the bumblebee. So it's, when you start to look at it, it's quite incredible. There's about over 250 species of bee in the UK, which is quite astounding, really. Um, yes, it's, it's in there. And it's, and it's, it's it, so most of them, sorry, I'm stumbling there. Most of them are uh, solo bees. So they don't belong in a hive or together. So only, for, only a few bees do that, bumblebees and honeymakers. Most of them are individuals that live on their own. Quite a lot of them will live in the grass, in the in the ground, um, and over winter there. So that's always another reason why you have to be careful with your grass cutting. And things like uh, a lot of mason bees will grow, in, they'll get into walls or wood or anything like that. So there's quite a massive ways of, uh, of, of bees to live in, a lot of big variety. Um, again, I'll say about high cut, the long uh, cut, make sure it's over 2.5 centimetres. Don't cut it too short. You're not disturbing them too much. You could even just get a piece of wood, bore holes in it, and mason bees or quite like that. The type of plants you choose especially uh, are quite important, especially if you like the, the sort of modern varieties. A lot of plant breeders have actually now bred the pollen out of plants. 
they got them for show in a garden centre. They look amazing, but they're no good to the bees. The pollen gets spread out of them. Same with big blousy double flowers, um, that, where the bees just can't actually get in. They can't actually access the pollen when you overbreed the, the petals on them. So try and keep the, the, the flowers you're growing quite as simple as possible, really, so the bees can access it. Um, yes, yeah, so, and also use natives is a good one. Use native plants like this. Uh, um, anything like a bluebell right way through. So anything, even grasses and stuff, some bees will go for. So, yeah, that, I, I know that um, somebody, you've had a bee talk before. It's not my massive expert um, area of expertise, but um, if you plant, if you plant properly and you allow for them, then the bees will come. Next slide, please. Butterflies as well. Oak doesn't like a butterfly. Obviously, they've been in quite a lot of problems in recent years. We've had uh, population decline, but it picked up quite highly apparently last year. Um, certainly, planting um, obviously plants like buddleia, uh, lavender. Well, they'll quite like that as well. Um, but also, you can do butterfly pies. You can, if you want to help them on their way. So you can see on the left there, old sort of fruit. You can put out sort of half rotten bananas. We used to do them at schools where you'd sort of get a um, dig a hole out. And you might layer it with a bit of plastic, punch of that plastic, put some mud in with some sugar, and that sort of uh, produces them as well. So, but mainly it's planting. We mentioned quite a lot of plants, but that sunken pot in the corner, you can put little pebbles in, maybe put a little bit of rotten fruit in, and see if you can encourage them into the garden. The big thing for them, and it is for moths as well. We'll go on to moths next. Is making sure that the caterpillars have somewhere to pupate. So again, you want a fairly wildish area, long grass area where they can go and pupate and be not disturbed. Next slide, please. Moths as well, very very important um, part of our wildlife. Our pollinators, obviously, you know, you can obviously usually see the uh, the plants that are pollinated by moths because they have a very long um, petiole or long sort of stem of flowers. The honeysuckle is a great example of that. Uh, even in primrose. These again are in decline. I think you know it's just as more, I think probably the you know the more uh, human um, activity there is, the harder they find it. But we can encourage them in with the right planting. Uh, native honeysuckle is a great example. Um, you can also, if you wanted to find out how many moths are visiting you, because obviously many of them are nocturnal, so you might not be looking out for them or no idea. Is I'm told that if you get a bit of treacle and an old sock and hang that, you can then go out with your torch and you can see how many moths that brings into your garden. And you can see how rich it is for moths. So uh, I think they're really important. I think, um, again, if you want them to be there, you need to leave an area where they can pupate, caterpillar and pupate. It's, it's, it's really important with both. I think we talk about the adult all the time, but actually the caterpillar stage is really, really important. Um, nettles is a brilliant um, plant. For, for caterpillars so maybe you can leave a little group of nettles down the bottom of the garden or somewhere if you've got the space and that will help the uh the um not everybody's cup of tea but there'll be other plants you can do as well next slide please so a little bit of gardener's friends i always call it a little bit of those those sort of um creatures that are in the garden that help you out i love a hoverfly um it's absolutely superb uh, hoverflies the larvae of a hoverfly will eat up to 500 aphids a day they're absolutely ferocious aphid eaters. So that'll keep them off your uh, your vegetables. If you want to encourage them in, uh, a fennel is a great plant. You let fennel grow up and flower. They're absolutely, tons of uh, hoverflies will come. They absolutely love it. And then you obviously got that, that balance in the garden because the hoverflies are feeding on the aphid. Obviously our friend, the cat, uh, the ladybird is uh, very, very important. I always think a little bit about organic gardening is it's a, a patience thing. You're going to get black fly on your broad beans like, that's as inevitable as the sun's coming up. The point is, is not to panic. But if you wait a couple of weeks, the ladybird and the ladybird larvae will show up and, uh, and hopefully contain that for you and keep it in order. So remember that these, uh, the, these creatures that are in the garden are also doing a job for you as a garden. The gardens are partnerships, a shared space, and you want these creatures involved. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk about reputations now because... <laughs> Always, uh, some some animals have a real uh, uh, insects have a real bad one for some reason. Slugs, I feel a bit sorry for in a way because there's I think over twenty types of slug and only two will attack your plants. Two or three will attack your plants. This is the leopard slug here, which is a recycler. If you get them in your compost bin, you're laughing. So it's kind of quite important to have a look at what's there to start with. Also, it's part of the food chain. Um, so have a little look because it might be you have a useful slug. You get slug, quite a different lot of slugs in compost bins. They might be doing a job for you, okay? This is why we're totally opposed to any kind of pellet or anything like that, really, because you 
it's just indiscriminate. You're just hitting everything rather than the target you want. So in the old days, we might have had a missile thrush to come in and eat the slugs that we don't want, but times have changed. But little hat off to the leopard slug who does a very important job. Wasps, I think most people, we think... They associate them with buzzing around um, them in the in the late summer. Um, they see them, but there's actually I, I read today that there are something like seven thousand types of wasp in the UK of all different shapes and sizes. They're a huge, the important part of the um, the ecosystem. But the big ones that we know are very good eaters. Of, they'll eat aphids as well, small insects. So they do a job as well. They do quite a crucial job. Earwigs, another aphid eater. Um, originally, earwigs were. Um, were used uh, were on orchards before we started spraying ap- our apples quite heavily. They were quite good at eating mealy bugs and woolly aphids. So they, again, are, are quite an important predator. Uh, we sort of associate them with damaging flowers. I understand that a little bit, but I think there's room for both. And obviously, obviously our friend, the spider, the garden spider, um, is a good trapper of flies, aphids, etc. So they got a bit of a bad reputation, maybe, these creatures, but they're there for a reason and they do a good job. Next slide, please. So little things we can do to make the garden um, wildlife friendly. Habitat poles, you might have heard all those. This is quite a grand one, with um, quite a big one. You can do this on a small scale. You can do a little pile of sticks. You can do one in a pot. You can fill it up with old bits of wood, moss, any natural materials. Just somewhere then for them to hide away and be safe, really. Nice and dark and dank. You know, get your centipedes, your millipedes in there. They're great recyclers as well, and predators. So you want just somewhere. I think this one is not very artistic. You could maybe actually, you know, sculpt one or something like that. So, but having piles are quite important, particularly through the winter, um, the, the autumn winter, I always put piles around my allotment. Uh, they do it at right and Emma does it at right as well. So you've got areas that you know that uh, creatures can overwinter. Next slide, please. And of course, the, the famous bug hotels, um, <laughs> they've been given, I've always, yeah, I'm always interested in bug hotels because they're very important, but they can look a bit ugly in a garden, I think. They, I think maybe we could be a bit more artistic with them. Um, I would quite like the mushroom on the left that some kids did with me, and uh, yeah, I have quite like that. Green roof on your bug hotel maybe improves it. The best ones I've seen, actually, is you can get old branches with lots of sort of branchlets on it and then stick them in the ground and then hang stuff on those as well. So you can be a bit artistic, I'm saying. This doesn't, bug hotels are very useful. You can do them completely recycled materials. They do an important job in protecting some of the species you want in your garden. But let's be, maybe we could be a bit more imaginative with them. Next slide, please. And then I think also I'll put this up just because I worked in schools a lot um, in my in my role as Blue Peter. And, and one of the easiest things to do to get kids interested is, is get them to design a, a bug hotel or an insect house, if you like. If we call it that or a bee hotel. There can be anything simple from... <laughs> Bamboos bound together, or anything you can find in the garden and stuff. I think that's a good family activity, grandkids' activity. Um, and also, then you can also explain the wonderful world of bees and butterflies to them as well, and all the other things that go on in the garden. Next slide, please. Well, this is my little hoverfly lagoon. Uh, I don't know if any of you uh, have read a book by, by David Goulston. I know that we interviewed him on our podcast, and quite an interesting guy. But I got this uh, idea from his book, uh, The Garden Jungle. And this is just a little um, hoverfly lagoon. And it's, so this is just water in a, in a cup or a, a container like this. You put old dead leaves, brown leaves in the bottom, and then you put these bam- bamboo in. What happens is the hoverfly lay the larvae in there. The larvae can eat on the decaying matter in the pot, and then they climb out when they're ready to go fly off of the bamboo. It's a great little idea. You probably see that in a border somewhere, so they've got a bit of privacy. But I love the idea, I love the idea of a hoverfly lagoon. Uh, that's, that's just a great name, and it does a really useful job. Next slide, please. Bat boxes as well. I, I like I said earlier, I'm, I was very, very lucky to get to get birds, um, get bats off my balcony area. Uh, it's really they, they sort of appear for about two months a year. Um, I'm up in the tree line, so I think they really like hedges or tree lines because they feed off the top of that. Um, but this is a bat box. Uh, it's, it's very slim. They're incredibly good at uh, squeezing into small crevices. Bats. Um, obviously, again, they're, they're predators, so they feed um, quite well. They need to be a, the, the bat box needs to be four meters in height, and it needs some daytime warmth. So, sort of a bit of maybe again uh, a bit of couple of hours of sun a day would be would be quite good. It's quite a good idea to keep them away from artificial lighting. 
So if you've got one of those security lights that clicks on or something like that, that could uh, that could disturb them. But I, I've got one, but I've never found a bat in it. Um, I've never, but I'm keep trying and praying because I'd love to see one in there. I really would. What a treat that would be to have a bat. But um, I do see them out out above the trees. Um, they are vulnerable to disturbance. So if you put a bat box up and you know they're in there, then uh, you have to tiptoe around them. But what a great thing it would be to to get a bat um, in, in your garden. Next slide, please. And of course, our friend the hedgehog. I'll see this um, week again. There's news how their numbers are declining. Um, so um, you know, it's a bit of sad. They're very important. We're moaning about too many slugs. Well, this guy will clear up your slugs for you, no problem. And we, what we need to do is we make need to make provisions for them. I think the big one is uh, is making sure we call them hedgehog highways. You might have heard of them, where people are cutting a small hole in the kickboards on their fencing. That's the bottom board you'll get when, when they make your fence. Well, you cut a hole in that. So what can happen is hedgehogs can move between gardens. Apparently, this has happened over in Hackney um, with the wildlife uh, club over there. And it's been really, really successful. So they kind of they'll come if you make provisions for them. Obviously, crossing roads and stuff is very dangerous for hedgehogs as well. So the idea they can move around from garden to garden without disturbance is, is, is a pretty good is a pretty good thing to be able to do. Next slide, please. And of course, you can obviously build them and they will come. Um, so this is a hedgehog house. Uh, you could do homemade ones of these. I remember doing one on Blue Peter years ago. That very long sort of entrance way is quite important because that will stop other animals getting in, ape foxes, etc. So you have that long entrance. We built this one on the right. This is actually on my neighbour's allotment. We built this one out of old bricks and stuff and we've got hedgehogs in it. This is in North London. And there's a pair as well. So hopefully they're a breeding pair. It's really exciting when they turn up like that because you just don't expect it. Uh, we've got a sort of night camera in there. When it comes to feeding them, there's a lot of uh, talk about this. Dog food, cat food, cat biscuits are probably about, that's about right. I don't think really, uh, and water, they'll quite enjoy water as well. Um, but it just shows you, doesn't it? If you put in a little uh, hedgehog house and then what happens is they turn up. So if you sort of create the provision, these things will come along. And that's, uh, that's quite an exciting moment, really. Next slide, please. Well, I don't know how many of you like snakes. <laughs> I quite like snakes. I don't know how many you'll get in North London, mind you. But I go fishing quite a lot and you see grass snakes and um, they're amazing swimmers, by the way. But you can build one of these, um, uh, Hibernalicum. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Probably not. But this is quite simple. It's literally a, a pit, basically. And you put in these uh, access with these bits of pipe in and they can just get down, fill it with rubble and rocks and old uh, leaves and soil and the snakes can get in and out. Slow worms will love this as well. So not just snakes for those of you who don't like slow worms. Um, but again, I don't think you'd have any problem with mice. <laughs> they can control your mice population. Um, brilliant. It doesn't look very good when you see it on the right there in the photo. But just think you put that into a border, you plant climbing, you plant uh, ground cover on top of it, plant some pollinators on top of it. You've got a great little uh, place for snakes or slow worms to hang out. And I think that's a great idea. I really do. Next slide, please. I mean, there's a little bit to say about my, um, the importance of fungi. They're just incredible things, fungus. These, so these are nature's recyclers. I think people tend to be a bit scared of them because they think, oh, it's going to be poisonous, which is understandable if you have young kids knocking around. The ones you'll find in your gardens, probably haymakers, you get the little brown ones in the lawn. Uh, completely harmless. What they're doing is they're breaking down any old roots or anything like that that uh, were previously there. Uh, um, fungus are really important in symbiosis. So the fly garrick you see at the top right there, my top right, that has, that lives on the roots of the birch tree. So when the, the great when the great thaw happened at the last ice age, the birch followed the thaw in mycorrhizal association with this fungus. Okay, so they completely what happens is the, the the tree will give the fungus food in return for minerals coming out of the soil from the fungus. So they live side by side and it really counts for its success. In rainforests, most trees will have a mycorrhizal association. Uh, it's a big part of nature. So when you see a mushroom, this is the fruiting body of the mushroom, the mushroom that's the, uh, the fungus itself is underground. You know that that's a really, really important piece of, uh, of, of the ecosystem. You might, if you, um, people, the honey fungus is on the right the bottom there, my right bottom. Obviously this gets seen as a bit of, um, this can be quite aggressive. It tends to only attack plants that are already weakened. It isn't an aggressor. It will move in if it feels a plant is on its last legs. It's a secondary attacker, really. But you might not like the sight of it. I don't know. If you if you take down a tree and you don't want it, maybe dig the stump out. Personally, I'd be happy to let it be there. It's uh, going to break that fungus stump down for you. Next slide, please. And this is a good one as well. This is rot holes. Um, so this is uh, where they've taken a branch off. 
and they've left a little bit. Normally, you'd prune to what you call the Cambium Ridge when you take a branch off, and that's the the little sort of ridge of of cells you get around the base of the of the branch. And if you cut to the outside of that, the tree will heal itself naturally. Uh, heal trees don't um, heal; they seal basically. They cut off any potential disease. But you can leave a bigger one, and you get these rot holes. These are quite natural where the branch is broken. Although the one on the right is a bit of a fasciation going on there with the trees mutated a bit with cells but it's got a sickleman growing in it it's found its way in which i find quite good but these are great these are little universes in the run right great for earwigs great for hoverflies so you've got all this little life going on in there so it's nice to have one of these things if you did want it on a live tree you could just take a section light in the garden upright and let that little rot hole uh, create uh, be a home to a lots of different wildlife and insects next slide please Native hedging, of course, you can't go and miss with um, probably one of the most important things, certainly for little birds, um, just for cover, really. You don't need a massive area to have a native hedge. I would always plant whips, which are one year old uh, trees. You can get these free from people like the Woodland Trust if you've got involved with a school or a community. And I would plant them 30 centimetres apart and I plant them on the stagger. So one to the left, one to the right, one to the left, one to the right. I'll put a nice thick mulch down and that hedge will get up in a couple of years. Tip out the uh, the leader after the second season and it'll put the branches on. But I don't think you can really beat a native hedge. That could be hornbeam, hawthorn, um, field maple, brilliant plants. You, you've always got something going on in there as well with fruits, changing the season, the colours. So if you have got the space and you've got a little run, you know, you need a few metres, you can put a little native hedge in that is really helpful to wildlife. Next slide, please. And of course, we've got to get to the reptiles. So we're kind of coming on to the last part of the talk. And this is just um, about one of the biggest plate things you can do to have wildlife in your garden. There's a pond, obviously, because they just come from all around for it. I, I, quite, I love uh, frogs and toads um, and also newts. They're also good. Uh, frogs are great slug controllers as well. You want them in the garden. And the top of the food chain, but the pond itself is a big magnet for wildlife. It really is. So I'll just talk a little way through to make the simplest one, the simplest way to make a, a wildlife pond, because um, you can do it on any scale. You can even do it in a pot if you wanted. Next slide, please. So you can see here, I would do, I'd have the centre of it, probably 50 to 60 centimetres depth. I would dig it out and then I would put in shelves. You can, you can put in a couple of shelves if you wanted. Normally I'd put about 25 centimetres the first shelf around the edge. So you've got deep planting, um, edge planting, and then I'll try and par it off nice and level at the sides. I'll go through how I'd make that. I like this uh, drawing on the right. You can see how you've hit that shelf there. You can hold it in place in the stone, some footings, and then you've got the liner. So that's just a really very basic shape of a pond. Very easy to do, quite cheap to do. Next slide, please. So you could die. dig this out. I'll dig it out by some ground. I wanted. Sometimes what I'd probably do is I'd use a hose pipe to mark it so I'd get the shape I want. I would then get the spade with the top soil out, dig down the amount I wanted to go, give it a nice tread, firm it, and then I'd line it with sand. I'd make sure it's lined with sand because you're going to use a butyl liner because that's the cheapest way to do this and really very effective. Obviously, a spirit level on it to make sure you've got it nice and level, and that's quite a nice setup. And then next slide, please. And I'd lay over my butyl. I'd weight it with rocks. A butyl liner you can buy in any aquatic centre or garden centre. It's not expensive at all. Overlap it. Make sure you've got enough of it. Weight it down with rocks and then start to fill it. And gradually what happens, as the, as the, as the liner starts to fill into the pond, to hug the, uh, the shape of the pond, you just release the tension from those rocks and it will just sit in nice and tight. OK, so very easy to do. Hole, sand it, make sure there's no sharp objects in there because you don't want a butyl liner. Keep the butyl liner, gradually let fill it up with water, release the tension so it goes in nice and tight. And you've got a pond. Next slide, please. And you really want it to. Um, yeah, I'll come on to duckweed in a second. <laughs> I've seen that. I, I, got, I really want it to uh, look as natural as possible. So I really like these. A pond. I realise there's obviously issues if you've got young children knocking around. I would obviously that's a safety thing, but I love the way that, that this blends with the, the landscapes. You can see the butyl going in, and then it, it's been landscaped around it. it. Should look as natural as possible, I think. Um, I don't want fences around it or uh, rocks that have been brought for the garden centre. It should be gravel that's, nat that's planted through as natural as possible. Next slide, please. See this? I love this edge in here with the pebbles. And you know what? That's so great about that is that's just perfect access 
for frogs and toads and newts, especially frogs and toads. You want your you want your uh, your, your ledge your, your, um, for your shallow planting, but you also want a sloped area where animals can, leave, can come in and leave again. Okay, so it's really see so at night time they can come in and go when they're out. The frogs are out, etc. So just that natural edging is really important, sloping in so so wildlife's got access. Next slide, please. So you get three types really of plant I think are important for for uh, for for the uh, for a pond. Um, you get natives like uh, marginals, like the uh, the marsh marigold on the top there, which is a brilliant plant. Flowers for long periods of time, great for wildlife. Gets nice and big and softens the edge of that pond up quite nicely. And then obviously you've got central plants. Obviously, what is better than a water lily? They're such a beautiful plant. What you tend to do is you, you'll maybe get a pot of it and then you'll plant it, sit it on bricks. So the, the leaves floating on the top and as the plant starts to grow, you can remove those bricks and so it gets deeper and deeper. So you can get it quite down deep if you do it by that method, if that makes sense. And of course, uh, an oxygenator is very important, making sure that if, uh, it doesn't go, turns to algae. Those plants like a lodia or something like that will help keep the pond clear. Next slide, please. When it comes to planting, it's got to be done really in a basket. I would use a mixture of compost and topsoil. Um, and you've got this, you might want to line it with some, some cloth, but you want the plant roots to be able to breathe, really. So you have these baskets like this and you can plant these up and then they just sink into the centre or sink into the bottom. So nice top soily loam and you can then um, plant that up and sink them into the areas you want to go. Next slide, please. This is a bit extravagant. But I just wanted to talk about rainwater. Um, somebody just put a question up about duckweed or and I know it's very invasive. We have it in the canals around here. Um, well, one of the reasons it's so successful is usually a lot, a lot of the tap water we use is full of nitrates and algae and duckweed love nitrogen. So it tends to that. So if you can capture any, if, you're, if you've got a pond and you capture as much rainwater as possible, that will greatly reduce that problem. Um, so that definitely this is a, this is quite a big pond. This is in. I wouldn't expect you to get big barrels or anything, but you might be able to run something off the roof of the shed or something like that to make sure you're capturing as much rainwater. Water for your garden, for maybe for watering but also for your pond if you can. Next slide, please. So there's your, your duckweed. And <laughs> I think that it's exactly, make sure you can use rainwater. You can use strawberry ba uh, straw bales, which will suck the nitrogen out as well. That'll clear your pond. If you've got a combination of oxygenating plants, straw bale. And the other one is, is actually um, your weed in the, in the pond is really good for the compost heap if you mix it in with browns. So you have your, when you do a compost, you have 50 browns, which is carbon-based products. 50% greens, which is weeds, and if you get that from the pond and chop it all together, it's good for the compost bin. So it's not a total disaster if you do get some pond weed in your pond. Um, but there's certainly the straw bales is helpful. I know Emma put them in at Wrighton and they cleared it out. Really, they, do, they really work quickly. And then your oxygenators, and hopefully you won't have too much of a problem. Next slide, please. And I just thought I'd put this up because it really is... Um, a, a, a universal its own right isn't it the uh, I like the fact that things like if you get dragonfly because apparently the larva the dragonfly is one of the one of the most ferocious um pond animals there is it's the dinosaur the transaurus rex of the pond they say because it, it eat the predators but i just love you get fact you get all this wildlife um um actually one of the best times to see a pond is if you go out at night with your torch and, uh, and have a look at it then it's usually absolutely buzzing with uh with with with, with stuff and um, also you know things like um hedgehogs foxes maybe will come to drink from the pond as well it really is like it's a water hole like when you see these nature pro programs and they all come uh, the elephants and the lions all come to the water hole to drink well this is our version of that just on a different small slightly smaller scale but it still applies you know you put in water wildlife will come next slide please the other thing I think if you're going to do a pond and you really should as well do this is put next to it a bog garden because they are brilliant for wildlife. Um, I think if, what you tend to do is you follow the exact same um, technique. So you dig another hole next to your pond. And what you do is this time you put your sand in, you put your butyl liner down. But this time you get a fork and you puncture it. OK, put in some rocks, plant it. The amount of plants you can get that look amazing in a bog garden. It's a gardener's dream, really. There's, there's all the plants you can use. From hostas to ligularias to stillbees to penistamens, you can really go to town on a bog garden. Put in some rocks as well for your frogs and your toads to hide under. Make it amazing. So for me, the perfect wildlife area is a pond with a bog garden sat next to it. Nice and level, natural edging, and that'll bring in lots and lots of wildlife. Next slide, please.
And you just don't, I know it's quite important as well, as you don't, not all of everybody's got a garden in London. 50% of the people who live in London don't have a garden. I'm on the third floor, so I balcony, I balcony garden. It's amazing what you can do, but it doesn't mean to say you can't have water either. You can have a little pond like this quite easily, you know, so don't think that, I think it's all a matter of scale. If you, there's obviously different, the husbandry is different if you're on a balcony or in containers. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But it's, I get so much pollinator action and bird action on my balcony. It's not a cut off to wildlife just because you're, you're gardening in the air. Next slide, please. I'm just going to say a little bit about a rain garden because these are popping up all over the place. And these are quite, in a way, an alternative to long arms. If you've got very wet, soggy ground, these are appearing all over the place. And um, what it is, is people think rain garden, they think um, plants that can take damp grounds. It's actually the opposite. It's drought. It's that you want drought resistant plants because what you want to do is you want it to drain as quickly as possible. If you're on very heavy clay and you're having tr uh, trouble with um, stuff, not uh, too much watering in it, this is quite good. So next slide, please. Let's explain a bit more about it. As you can see here, so if you're down here, what you do is you remove the substrate and you make a nice sandy substrate you know really sort of like a groundsman's mix you might get if you go to a turf company they'll have bags of groundsman top dress that's perfect for it and you can dig a hole put that in and then plant drought resistant plants in it long grasses quite a lot of flowers who take dry conditions um, and you can fill that up and then that overflows or drains away so it's a great little way to capture you put that in the lowest point of the garden that will drain stuff off and you'll also create a little environment for wildlife next slide please so this is the puddle garden. Sorry, the titles are the wrong way around there. This is the puddle garden. So if you're on heavy clay and you don't want a rain garden, this is your alternative, is you can just dig out your pond and literally let nature do its work. A lot of the big ponds in Victoria, in Victorian um, gardens like Sheffield Park were all clay based. So the best thing about this is you can spend the winter in your wellies treading clay, which is uh, from, a, from a garden point of view, I really like the idea of that. So you just want it to compact, clay's full of iron particles and they bond, they bond together. And so you want that to happen and hopefully you can get after a bit of effort, a natural clay pond. Takes a bit of patience, but it's probably well worth doing. Next slide, please. So I'm, I couldn't help but drop the Blue Peter garden in because that, for one reason, um, I wanted to show off, but no, not really, I'm only joking. The one thing you don't want in a pond, a wildlife pond, is fish, OK? That's just the one thing that will deter. They'll eat all the tadpoles, they'll eat the baby newt. Eat... So if you wanted a formal pond with fish in it, that's a different ball game to a wildlife pond. It's good to make that distinction, I think. If you do have a formal pond like this, it's fine. You can still have a wildlife pond. It doesn't matter what shape it is, but just give the fish a little bit of a swerve would be my advice. Next slide, please. And also, as some fun with it i think this is great i think a little bit of landscape and we do pontoon walkways you could do these through woodlands as well just that idea like of a viewing platform where you can look out in the pond look for the wildlife there skinny dip with your kids with your nets and stuff or you could do it on a bigger scale like the one i left so have a little look at how you access it how you how you use your ponds once it's all up and growing next slide please I'll just say a little bit about the things that ain't going to help are not going to help your um, your garden. Um, it's interesting about um, about chemicals, really. Uh, I, you know, I think that I'm an organic gardener, so I could obviously I'm not going to. They're not in my vocabulary in terms of how I garden. But I did years ago. Obviously, I've been a gardener for 40 years, so I am familiar with pesticides. I remember about 20 years ago having a path that had weeds in it in my house. And I sprayed it with Roundup. And what was interesting about it is the bird life immediately went down. Because what you're doing is you're knocking out all that smaller insectivorous life. And then that, that and then moves up the food chain. So I, mean, I think from my point of view, if I want birds and birdsong in my garden for that reason alone. Also, if you've got a dandelion in, the, in your patio and it's annoying you, just use some boiling hot water from a kettle. It'll do exactly the same job and save yourself 30 quid as well. So I think that makes sure that when you, if you know, with these things that you will, obviously I can't, uh, coat off enough for AstroTurf, which is appearing more and more all over the place. It's just sheets of plastic, really. That's why earlier I wanted to um, really speak up lawns and been able to put clover and, and, and bellis and stuff and daisy into a lawn because actually there's nothing like sitting on a lawn when the sun's out, is there really? Or you know, I just think artificial lawns, they're kind of the height of laziness in some ways, but maybe people have got busy lives and it suits them, but they're certainly not good for nature, as is, you know, tar um, bricking over your front garden which is a tremendous problem in north london we get all these floods here 
Well, there's because there's nowhere for the water to go because we bricked all our front gardens to park our cars on. And uh, so even if you wanted to park your car, now there's examples of this around here. Just leave some gaps out and plant into that somewhere for the water to go, somewhere for wildlife to go. So there's no reason to completely brick it over. And again, I said mentioned it a few times. Rugby cut. If you can do it with a non-petrol mower, even better. Make sure the cut's nice and high when you cut. The other thing I forgot to mention is when you do it, if you've got hedging, little birds, don't cut it until late May when the fledglings have gone. So a little, little considerations like that will make sure you're taking care of your wildlife and you can still go about having a garden that is useful, that is productive to you, that you can, you know, you can get the grandkids around to run around on the grass. You can do both, no problem. Next slide, please. So this is a container garden from a few years ago of mine. In here is all, uh, lots of uh, um, annuals, bedding. Uh, um, I've got sweet corn growing there, tomatoes. I've got herbs growing. I've got soft fruit. So really the rule with this really is I use a decent peat-free compost. But the rule with me is I, I what I tend to do is I grow everything from seed and that tends to make it quite resilient. Uh, okay, I don't buy it in. So it starts off in the garden or in my, in my front room normally and I harden it off out there. So it's kind of, it's used to those conditions by the time it gets going. I use a liquid feed. I use comfrey liquid feed for the first part of the year, say from um, early May, late, um, late April, early May through till June. And then I'll put comfrey pellet in as well. So that's slow releases for the rest of the season. So that feeding is quite important. The big one for me is 10 minutes every day is to water. I never water with a hose. I go around, I look at my plants. It's a bonding exercise and a container garden can give you so much pleasure. It really can. And, um, You'd be amazed what you can do in a small space. I, I, I worked in Tokyo for five years and that's all I had was small spaces. And um, and it's amazing what you can do. It really is. So don't be put off. If you've got, you know, grandson who's in London, he's always got as a balcony. You can still garden. You can still eat off it. I had enough tomatoes to take a bath in them last year off my balcony. You really can garden. No problem. Next slide, please. And of course, in the big one coming to the end now, folks, um, is you know, if you want to do a bit of wildlife for centuries, then plant a tree. This is the uh, one of the first the first tree I ever planted. This is a Cornish elm, um, which is now be 40 years old. I think these these trees live to 600 years old in age. I think that for longevity, which is something as as a, as you know the human race seems to have trouble with, um, for longevity and gardeners do think long term. Um, you can get out and plant a tree, um, a nice big oak, or um, Cheers, Sam. Nice big oak or, uh, you know, a nice beach. Um, if you want to start smaller with some birch trees, I just think planting a tree is a wonderful one. Important rule, square hole, never a round hole in the roots and get out into the surrounding soil. OK, square hole. That's um, for my time at Kew. Um, that's definitely how it's done. Next slide, please. And have some fun again. I'm, I'm going to bring in families and kids. Um, a garden's there, you know, to for, it's where you go to relax, it's where you go to enjoy it, and it's there for you, and it's there for all the things that choose to visit it. And if you want to make it some fun like this and plant this up and, you know, with hardy annuals or whatever you want, just have some fun with it. You know, I just think um, there's no rules to it, really. Um, there's no rules to it. You can just really enjoy it. That's great. Cheers, Jane. Next slide, please. It's the last one, I think. Yeah, and this is me watching... The sunset with a great tit in my front room. So I think, you know, you can peel away all the layers of the onion, but you have these little magic moments where it's just you and nature. And um, that's just a wonderful thing. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think there's one more slide. Uh, yep, yeah, that, um, it's going to be there. But thank you so much for listening to me and being patient. That's great. Thank you. Chris, that was amazing. Thank you, thank you so much. I hope everybody else enjoyed that. Um, I think we have got a couple of questions in the chat so let's just have a quick look um let me go up to the top um i can never make enough compost to be self-sufficient what do you recommend well it could increase i suppose it's i have the same problem really on the allotment because it takes a lot i tend to maybe uh, sub it up a bit with I get um, manure delivered to bulk it up make sure that's well rotted so you can bulk up with delivery um, that's certainly a possibility so you are sort of bringing it in but if you live near a, a, an urban farm or near a farm then that's one thing but I think the big rule with it is you have to be quite sparing with it to me it's like black gold I don't throw it around I'm quite I'm very targeted with it so if I've got 
um, say, a, a courgette. And then courgettes come sort of, they, they give me so much veg, but come sort of July, they're really susceptible to moulds. Then I would use compost to use it as a mulch or a newly planted tree. Or so I would be quite sparing with it. The other thing you could do is you don't, if you've got open ground, plant a green manure, plant in, you know, uh, something like mustard. So you can overwinter it as that and dig that in. So you're actually composting as you go, if you like. So there's various different methods. Your compost bins, your green manures, you know, those, those. So you're, do, you're thinking it on, on a few different layers. That makes sense. Lovely. Thank you. Someone's saying their birds, uh, the birds are ignoring their boxes, their bird boxes. <laughs> yeah, what no, are they doing wrong? I don't know. Hey, turn, turn the heavy metal down. You'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, they they you know when they shy even with the feeders the first year I was here they just I, I pull this food out and they would just fly by it I think it takes them a little while to feel confident or, or to sort of notice it's there it really is a game of uh, patience I believe so I wouldn't get too worried about it I think the the, the one that's going to go there if you see a lot of them in the garden is the blue tits will probably eventually go okay I'll have I'll, I'll I'll have a go so perseverance is my advice on this on this uh, on this subject. Right, I'm conscious of time, but I'll just do this this question. I've heard that Budlia don't have good quality nectar, it's like pollen, pollen for um, butterflies. Well, I that think that, well, I think it, it, well, there's a lot of hybrids now. One, one of the problems we've got in horticulture is plant breeding is quite a big business. So there's, there's nobody, so now we don't just have Budlia davidii, which is the original plant, which came from China, a, a collector at the end of the last century. We've got lots of different kinds where they breed them and they because they obviously want to sell them. It's a marketable thing. And if you breed a really good budlier, then you'll make quite a lot of money. But what happens is you tend to then compromise the pollen count of that plant. So what to do is just plant the species, just plant the original budlier. You know what I do is I'd go out to a car park. I mean, they're not exactly hard to find, are they? And I'd go out at the end of the summer and I would collect that seed and I'd sow it in a propagator and I would grow it on. And you're guaranteed that butterflies will like that when it goes. Brilliant. Um, as I say, I am conscious of time. I've seen Hannah has put the link to Garden Organics in the chat, but I will also next week I'll be sending out um, uh, email which will have the link to this video that we've got today um, and some questions. If they, if we've missed anything, I'll get the answers on there. Mm -hmm. I'll also put all the links for Garden Organics as well and to, you know be able to join their their membership as well as. So that will all go out to you next week. Um, just a couple of things before I let you all go is um, if you could, if there's anything else that you think you would like to see us do as a cult conversation similar to this evening, if you can pop it in the chat or, or send us an email, let us know. Um, this is just one of um, many member engagement opportunities that we are facilitating. So keep an eye out on our membership page because we've got another programme of events coming up for this year. Um, 11th of May is our Fairy Living Festival and AGM. And this year it's being held at the Walsall Football Club. Um, so we'd love to see you there. And we're looking to do a sort of plant and seed swap shop it's um at the event um we're hoping that um we can get some ideas from garden organics or uh, have them come along as well um if possible but um yeah we're looking to do sort of a a plant and seed swap shop so bring your extra plants along or seeds and we can have a swap over um and the last thing um if you wouldn't mind just in the chat if you could just wouldn't mind taking 10 seconds just to drop a score out of 10 for tonight's um, event, I would be really, really grateful. Um, but other than that, the last things to say is thank you so much, Hannah and Colin, uh, Chris, sorry, I'm looking at your surnames. Colin, sorry, Chris. Um, I think that is amazing. I hope everybody's enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, thank you for giving up your time this evening to actually present that. It was an amazing um session so thank you um we really appreciate it so um thank you for having us yeah thank you for inviting us and thank you for taking time out of your evening I, um and i'll just i'll just reiterate i know hannah will as well if you've bits of it you've missed or you want to ask me anything about it please do follow that up i'll be more than happy garden organic will be more than happy to help you out in uh any any queries you have okay yeah, which is the link I will give you in the email I send out next week. So you'll be able to just drop them a line at any time um, if you have got any queries or us and we can pass it on. It's entirely up to you, um, but you've got the options there. 
Um, so the last thing to say is then good evening. Um, hope you have a lovely rest of your evening and thank you so much for taking part.